All right, uh, we have started a new series, God and the Skeptics. <laughs> uh, prepare, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Part one, seven skeptical doubts. Uh, we are looking at this, the second of the doubts, and that is how could a good God allow suffering? I'm going to be dealing with suffering in the morning service, morning message, and, um, but this has been a, a thing, you know. Uh, I thought you had a, a all-powerful God. I thought he was supposed to be good, but look at all this suffering. Philosopher J. L. Mackey in his book, The Miracle of Theism, declared, if a good and powerful God exists, he would not allow pointless evil, but because there is much unjustifiable, pointless evil in the world, the traditional good and powerful God could not exist. Some other God or no God may exist, but not the traditional God. He's very positive about this, very, uh, very absolute in this. Notice the emphasis on pointless and unjustifiable evil. Uh, Hillary, an undergraduate English major in New York State, said, said it this way, God allows terrible suffering in the world. So he might be all-powerful, but not good enough to end evil and suffering. Or else he might be all-good, but not powerful enough to end evil and suffering. Either way, the all-good and all-powerful God of the Bible couldn't exist. When I was a child watching, I believe, black and white TV, um, much of my free time was spent doing that, um, I remember a, an interview with some university guy who basically put that, that thing forward. And a conclusion was that, in fact, there could, the, the traditional God of Christianity could not exist. So I want you to notice that it is the suffering that people go through that they are emphasizing. So as we see, this argument is not used by knowledgeable thinking anymore. Um, the people who have actually put their minds to this, even the unbelievers, uh, find that this is, this is not a very good argument, and we'll explain why. Ravi Zacharias, a great uh, Christian apologist, says the biblical worldview is the only one that accepts the reality of evil and suffering while giving both the cause and the purpose while offering God-given strength and sustenance in the midst of it. Uh, we are among uh, all of the religions of the world, or the, the only that uh, actually shows why evil came. They had the, you know, the myth of Pandora's box where she opened it up and all the evils came out. Uh, the, the true Pandora box was Adam and Eve sinning. So I want you to notice their thinking involves six false presuppositions. A presupposition is what you've already assumed to be true before you come to this argument. Number one, any evil is pointless and unjust. How do I know? If I cannot see the point or the justice. You see, I've emphasized the word I. Uh, if I don't understand it, then there is no understanding of it. So I, I think you can see here there's a point of pride in this. This hidden presupposition of the argument is very arrogant. Many cultists have begun their cults by saying, if the Bible says something I cannot understand, the problem is with the Bible. Try saying that to the medical encyclopedia. Try saying that to the Encyclopedia Britannica. I don't understand it, so it can't be true. Surgeons of the 1800s, they wiped their hands after one surgery and proceeded to another. They did not know of microscopic germs. They did not see any problems. Yet the first patient's disease was mysteriously spread to the second. You see, what's going on here is the problem is not God or the Bible, but the ignorance of the person who claims the problem. So to say, I would know if there was any point to this evil. Uh, fact is, we don't know much. Number two, false presupposition, all suffering is pointless. 
This would be a pretty hard proof if you can think about it. In fact, there is often a point to suffering, but even then it's not always seen at the time. It's seen after the fact. If you go back to Joseph of the Old Testament, he's a perfect example of this. God decided to provide a safe place for his little tribe of Israel to grow big and strong. <laughs> he chose Egypt as the place of safety. He enacted a plan that would welcome the little tribe and nourish it until it grew larger. And then later, it would strengthen and toughen the people with slave labor. This was in the plan of God. To accomplish the welcoming part, God needed a man of Israel ruling with the Pharaoh. So he took Joseph directly to Egypt and trained him under Potiphar, Pharaoh's chief bodyguard. Now he did this by his own brothers selling him into slavery. I want you to recognize that all the way through this, this was a lot of suffering. Joseph in the pit... Here's them debating whether to kill him on the spot or, more mercifully, to sell him into slavery into a foreign land. You know, that's the last words he heard from his brethren. So he became proficient in the language, being a slave, and the customs of court people, being a slave of the chief bodyguard. When Joseph graduated from this training, God shifted him to a place where he was in touch with people who worked personally with the Pharaoh. That happened to be prison, another sense of suffering, but uh, he, he ended up running the place. He, the warden says, you're doing a better job than I do. You, you take over. And, um, and so now the very people who worked with Pharaoh found out he could interpret dreams, that God could interpret dreams through him. So, from there, Joseph was elevated to a position second only to Pharaoh himself. This was as direct a line to this place as he could possibly get. All of Joseph's suffering as a slave and a prisoner had a point that he recognized only much later. Uh, young couple in seminary in California had a little apartment and they had a little son and he crawled up on the couch and he crawled up on the back of the couch and he looked out the second story window and then fell out the window onto the concrete sidewalk below and they were horrified and the people around them were horrified that here are people studying for the ministry at this uh, seminary and Bible college and so on. And, uh, and God would allow such a thing. And so they took the child to the hospital. Checking him out, they found that, the, uh, aside from perhaps a bruise, the fall hadn't hurt the child at all. God had miraculously preserved him. However, the x-rays and whatever else they were doing showed that the little child had a cancer up by his brain. If he hadn't fallen, you see, it wouldn't have been discovered. So this was the most direct way for God to reveal this to the family. And the child survived the operation, and as far as I've heard, uh, uh, was able to, to grow up well. So all who suffer are given the opportunity to gain more of God while losing something of the world. James chapter 1 shows how the believer may count it all joy to grow through suffering. You begin to weigh what actually is important in this world. We're not going to be here all that long, coronavirus or not. We're not going to last hundreds of years here. We are going to be with God forever. And how we are with him will count so much more. And so if we have to lose something of this world to gain more of him, to gain more of the character that he wants us to have, this is a, a bargain. Then the third false 
presupposition is that all suffering is undeserved. All su- not only not just pointless, but undeserved. Well, a couple of things here. One is sometimes suffering and pain comes as a direct result of sin. This is why God told them, told us not to do these things. They are bad for us, bad for others, bad for the society, bad for the community, bad for the world. Sometimes we suffer because we have sinned. God put enough of himself into the creation of the universe that if man follows God's path, it reduces suffering. But straying from his path increases suffering. Increases suffering. We have suffering because this is an evil age, evil time. But uh, we don't have to have great suffering if we follow the Lord. Psalm 40, verse 12. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold of me. You see, he points to the, the reason for it. It's not God sending some smiting blight just out of random. See? So that I am not able to look up, they are more than the hairs of mine head, therefore my heart faileth me. You recognize, I did bad, and it brings about a bad result. We must recognize that we ought to suffer for our sins. There, there is a reason why we suffer, you see. Even if God in his grace has kept us from much pain, we really deserve, in the final analysis, to suffer in hell. So can we legitimately complain, uh, complain if we have, not complaint, uh, if we experience a backache? Is that just intolerable? We miss hell, uh, but we have to suffer a backache. I've had backaches. I don't like them. Everything hurts when you have a backache. Matthew was limping. I didn't notice why, but he touched his right hip, so I think there was a, some little pain. What's that? It's old age. Yeah, old age. Um, you know, these are the things that happen. All right, he's not going to complain because he knows where, where he deserves to be. Uh, so A is sometimes suffering and pain come as a direct result of our sin. And then secondly, sometimes we suffer because of others' sin. You know, uh, the person who doesn't care or hurts other people is not necessarily their sin. It's this guy's sin, you see. When God sent the storm to bring Jonah back, it put every ship in the Mediterranean Sea in distress. Now we need to answer this question that was clarified for us by Pastor Jebediah Porter. Why did God allow sin to enter the world? I've been asked this a number of times. I read in the books, even the most intellectual of these people, and they're saying this is one of those unanswerable questions. Oh, it's in the power of God. We don't understand. We don't know why. Actually, we do. The answer from the Bible is quite clear. We understand the essential nature of God in 1 John 4, 8 and 10, uh, uh, 4, verse 4, whew, verse 8 and verse 16, chapter 4, verses 8, 16. Geometric progression, 4, 8, 16. God is love. That's not just a thing that he does. It is who he is. So we understand that the essential commands of God both from what he wants from us and what he wants us to do is Deuteronomy 6, 5, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. What, what does he ask of us? Love. Mark 12, 29, 31, Jesus answered him when they asked what's the greatest commandment. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love, he's quoting the Deuteronomy passage, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. A.T. Robertson calls this the four powers of man. And uh, this means with everything you have, physical, mental, spiritual, everything. This is the first commandment. And then he adds, the second is like, namely this, 
Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandments greater than these. Now you say, why is the second one like the first? Because he says love. Love God and love others. This summarizes God's law and all the prophets who are pointing back to the law. You could find any law, and if you understood it perfectly, you could trace it back to that's how to love God and or men. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7 says, God created to show his great love in such a way that all could understand it. And that was the very sacrifice of Christ. Therefore, God determined to ask for man's love. God is love and God asks love. That summarizes the whole Bible. This means man has the ability to accept God and his love or to reject God and his love. Understand this, that you cannot love if you don't have choice. Love is a choice. If you are programmed to love, it's not love. If, if your puppet tells you, I love you, well, it's, that's you, you, you see, you're doing it. Program your computer to adore you. That's, you did that. That's you. See. So it, the thing that actually loves must have a choice. So God said, that's got to be part of the deal. See, That's got to be part of the deal, the free, free choice. Ravi Zachariah again says, in a world where love is the supreme ethic, freedom must be built in. A love that is programmed or compelled is not love. It is merely a conditioned response or self-serving. Love compelled is a precursor to loneliness. Having the freedom to love when you may choose not to love is to give love legitimate meaning. So free will of necessity allows rejection, and the rejection of God, the rejection of his law, would mean sin. So without free will, sin would not exist, but neither would love. You see that? And God said, I'll accept the bad with the potential good to save men from their sin. So man's history demonstrates his selfish choice of sin that plunged mankind into pain, suffering in the beginning, God's sacrificial loves, saving him out of all pain and suffering at the end. The greatest example of undeserved suffering is the suffering of Jesus Christ. God entered this fallen world, accepted the pain and the suffering. It was not easy for Christ. Sometimes Jesus has been unfavorably compared to the martyrs, who died with amazing strength and calmness because Jesus asked God to take away the terrible death if he found it possible. We need to understand that Jesus promised to be with us, but when he suffered, even his precious father turned away. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus truly suffered as no man could ever suffer. Now the very paradox of the life giver, the creator of life, dying should make it clear that his suffering was greater than anyone else. Jesus accepted the undeserved suffering to accomplish his great task. We read this in Hebrews 12 too. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, seeing people saved, gaining them as brothers and in the family of God, he endured the cross, despising the shame. There was no, no part of him that enjoyed that or just laughed at it. He despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Some of us may have the opportunity to suffer to bring others to a saving knowledge of Christ. We will then be conformed to the image of Christ. So let me skip ahead. Our time is running out. Number four, miss uh, a wrong presupposition, suffering rules out God. And so uh, anyone who does believe people uh, does, why does anyone believe that people ought not to suffer? Why do you think that people ought not to suffer? In the popular theory of evolution, the strong overcomes the weak. The strong eats the weak. <laughs> Let's be clear. Uh, you chase them down and eat them, you see. 
Uh, this demands death, destruction, violence. The evolutionists should consider this essentially natural. Suffering should be natural. It's the, old, all, the only way we evolve, right? Why does the atheist think suffering is so terribly wrong and unjust? And why would he care? The non-believer in God has no basis for being outright outraged at injustice. To be shocked at unjust suffering is to assume there is a standard beyond the natural. Well, who set that standard? Why are you holding to that standard when you dis disregard God himself? Believers are shocked by suffering because we have an internal and supernatural idea how we ought to live in peace and justice, but this assumes God. So if the believer has a problem with suffering because it seems God could have stopped it for love's sake, the unbeliever has a problem with suffering because he should be encouraging it for evolution's sake. They should bow to the will of their God, evolution, that created everything. And then number five, less good is more evil. And this is where suffering is lumped in with people that just have less than what everybody else does. Maybe considerably less. Uh, maybe so much less that they suffer. In a pointless and undeserved suffering, sickness is pointless and undeserved suffering. Sickness instead of health, death instead of life, inability instead of inabil uh, ability, and pain instead of pleasantness. If a child becomes sick or a mother dies, God is blamed as not good or not powerful. This is a strong example of self-centeredness. Uh, let me uh, give this story. Bill Gothard told this story. I want you to think of your blessings. A man walks up to your house one Saturday morning and hands you $1,000 in cash. You ask about it, but there's no strings attached. He just wants you to have it. You're very grateful. But you set it aside because there's got to be some consequence to this. The next week he comes again and gives you another thousand dollars. This continues for three months. So you have begun to change the way you live. You buy an expensive car knowing you can afford the payments with your extra cash. The first Saturday of the fourth month, <coughs> you're out waiting on the front porch for the man to arrive. You watch him as he comes down the thing, walks right by your house, and gives the thousand dollars to your neighbor. You cup your hand to your mouth and yell out, you dirty thief, give me back my $1,000. It wasn't yours. It was a gift. When God stops giving you a gift, that's his choice. He's the giver of the gift. So he gave health to your children, he gave life to your children, to your husband, to your wife. If he chooses to take it, that is his right, and it's not out of malice. God does all things that are right. And Job began to see that very thing. So let me move on then to number six. All evil must be stopped by God, or else he's not good. All evil must be stopped by God. Perhaps we should ask if much evil would be stopped if people resisted it. Uh, perhaps evil is spread because we are not resisting it. We're not taking a stand against it. We're not calling people out for it. And I, I wanted to give you this example. Maybe you can put up the, uh, the text there, Deuteronomy. But two situations. A man uh, takes a woman by force. One in the city and one out in the country. And he says in the city... If they both accomplish their sinful deed, both of them should be put to death, the man and the woman. And you say, why? Because she should have cried out. And in the city, people would hear and respond. And he would have been stopped. Out in the country, when caught, the man is put to death, but not the woman. Because she was in the country, nobody would hear her cry. So interpret that in modern day, where you would be heard, where, uh, where your cry could be done. So, you know, listen to what all the policemen say, but when it comes to don't resist, don't do anything, this is not God's way. I've, I've read of several people that would cry out, a man was trying to hurt a woman, 
And she just cried out, oh God, please help him to see how wrong this is. Well, these people get this way because they don't put God before their eyes. And in the crying out, you put God before their eyes. It doesn't mean they'll stop. But it does mean they will, you know, but in these cases that I heard about, um, the guy ran off. Uh, she was saved because she cried out. So it perhaps is that. In James 4, 7b, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So people are usually afraid to resist, but being fearful is sin. Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and so on uh, end up in hell. Fear chooses action based on fear and not on what is right. Israel was told to walk through the Red Sea with walls of water on either side. That had to be scary. Somebody says, how long do you think it's going to hold? You know? Joshua was told to fight the battles with strength and courage. Just do it. Both of these commands seem to invite death. Fear would have said, no. Abused wives must resist evil by taking the abuser to the law, to the power over him. A woman being attacked must resist evil and cry out to God. This is to be done for God's sake instead of being submissive and silent for fear's sake. Fear says that would be foolish. Often the way of God does seem foolish to a worldly thinking. Yet in every situation, your question must be, what is the right thing to do? Don't try to outthink God. What's the smart thing? Throw yourself into the doing of the right thing and trust God to stop the evil. All right, quickly then, any questions? Let's bring up any questions, comments. 